welcome to worship. So glad to be able to connect with you this day and trust that uh, if you are worshiping virtually with us, uh, we trust that you are staying uh, safe and uh, perhaps you're worshiping virtually because, well, maybe uh, this is a weekend where you were not able to worship in person or this is your regular mode of worship. Either way, we are excited to be able to provide the opportunity to connect with God during these times. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we do have in-person worship each and every Sunday uh, morning at 10 a.m. in the church sanctuary. And uh, when uh, uh, your schedule allows and uh, your health permits, we look forward to seeing you there as well. As we have gathered here for worship, uh, as we so often do, I'd like to begin by reminding us of the truths of the common faith that draw us to God this day. The words of the Apostle Creed, I invite you to read with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, power, and Lord. Majesty, kingdom, authority. Jesus who died, now crucified, King of all kings. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify, Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. We invite you to participate today in the words of our call to worship. We have come to worship God, the living God, who calls prophets and teachers to bear witness. We have come to praise God, the almighty God, who answers the forces of hatred and hurt with the power of grace. We have come to worship God, all gracious God, who chooses even you and me to receive and carry the word of life and hope. All glory be to God. Well, very special greeting to some of our younger worshipers, be young in age or young in heart. I trust uh, that uh, the next few moments together might uh, help us better understand at least one spiritual principle of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. I have a couple of pictures I'd like to show you this morning. Uh, the first is like this one. This is the picture of a mother hen. And if you look very, very closely, you should be able to see under the mother hen one of her chicks. Uh, that she is protecting and comforting and making sure that that young chick is, uh, is secure and uh, uh, protected from any of the elements that, uh, that might do the little chicken harm. You know, in the Bible, Jesus uh, uses uh, one way to describe himself to us is as a mother hen 
who would have her chickens under his wings at all times. It is a way of saying that uh, no matter what circumstances we find ourselves in, Jesus is with us and Jesus with, wishes to protect us. Here's another picture of uh, another hen and a number of chicks. And my question to you is, what's different about these two pigs? Well, uh, on the first one, uh, as you see, the chicken is very securely nestled under the mom. However, in the other picture, <laughs> The chickens are kind of running on their own. They're running around. They're kind of scattered and not really living under the protection of the mother hen. You know, as much as God wants to be with us in circumstances and look over us like a hen, uh, a chicken does her young chicks, sometimes we get to running around and we forget where we need to find our security and our hope. Sometimes when things happen that we don't like or don't appreciate, we start running around and doing all kinds of crazy things to try to fix it. When all Jesus wants us to do is come back to him and allow him <laughs> to take care of us. Hopefully, maybe something to think about this morning. I now invite you to join me with a few moments of prayer an opportunity to share with God our hurts, our praises, and everything in between. I will allow us some silence at the beginning of this prayer time to allow you to settle your hearts and offer to him any particular request that you would have uh, to make of him personally this day. And then I'll offer some words of prayer on the screen, and uh, we will conclude, as uh, we often do, with the prayer that Jesus Christ himself taught. So with that in mind, I invite us to a bit of silence as we reflect upon our own needs and lift those to our Heavenly Father. Won't you read this prayer with me, please? Blessed are you, O Lord, our God. You alone do wondrous things. Blessed be your glorious name forever. May your glory fill the whole earth. O great and glorious God, your precepts are filled with mercy and justice. And every act you bless us with goodness. You call us to honor you, but too often we do so only with our lips instead of worshiping you we take the ways of the world and conform ourselves to them. Please, Lord, make us anew into your image, that your love may once more call us away from death and into your life. We know that every good endowment and every perfect gift comes down from you. And so by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray, bring us forth in your truth, that we might be the first fruits by hearing and doing your word. Join me in these words that Jesus Christ himself taught. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Tithes and offerings are one of the ways that we worship the Lord. It's not just a way of supporting the church or so that the sanctuary, the lights will turn on on Sunday morning and our bills are paid. It is an act of praise, an act of adoration. It is an act of faith and trust in our Lord that uh, the giving of tithes and offerings means something more uh, than just, as I said, paying the light bill. It is an act of worship whereby we tell God how important he is to us. And so uh, as you determine what your tithe and offering will be to Mariner United Methodist Church, first of all, thank you for your growth and for your commitment to God that is represented by those tithes and offerings and also this reminder of the means by which you might share them. 
Uh, you can mail them to the church via the regular mail. Bring to the church office. Uh, if we don't happen to be open, please uh, feel free to leave them in the lockbox immediately outside the office entrance. Or you may choose to give online via our webpage at marinerumc.org. Uh, any of those are perfectly acceptable, and I invite us now simply to pray as I ask God's blessing upon you, the giver, and upon the gifts that you offer to him. Father, thank you for the capacity that we have to share in the work of the kingdom through our tithes and offerings. Father, we love you, and we hope that these tithes and offerings reflect both that love and our desire that others might know the same love that we do through the ministries that we provide. To that end, we surrender them to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a lighthouse on the hillside that overlooks life's sea. When I'm tossed, it sends a light that I might see. And the light that shines in darkness now will safely lead me home if it wasn't for the lighthouse my ship would sail no more and i thank god for the lighthouse I Jesus is the lighthouse, and from the rocks of sin, he has shown a light around me that I could clearly see if it wasn't for the lighthouse. Tell me where will this ship be? Everybody that lives around here, they say tear that lighthouse down. The big ships, they don't sail this way anymore. There's no need it standing round. Then my mind goes back to that stormy night when just in time I saw the light, the light from that old lighthouse that stands upon the hill. And I thank God for the lighthouse. I owe my life to Him, for Jesus is the lighthouse. And from the rocks of sin, He has shown a light. If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be? If it wasn't for the lighthouse, tell me where would this ship be?
In the language and words that we use of our faith, perhaps uh, no more predominant term is used, particularly in the New Testament, in the ministry of Jesus and in those that wrote following his earthly ministry, is the concept of grace. The grace of Almighty God. You know, anybody that's truly experienced the grace of God certainly has a, a supreme understanding of what that grace means. Like many theological terms, uh, there are different facets to grace and different depths of our understanding and experience of that grace. This morning, I am very aware that as we talk about grace, it can too easily become just a term that we use without much reflection upon the significance of what the grace of God really is and what it means to you and to me, and how that grace can energize and fuel our faith uh, rather than just be a, a, a term or a word that we use without attaching a significant amount of meaning to it. So I've chosen a passage of Scripture today that I believe illustrates uh, in uh, very uh, uh, clear terms uh, at least some of the facets of what, is, uh, what we know is the grace of God. So with that in mind, it's a little bit longer passage today, and uh, I'm going to take a little time and uh, read it through with us. Uh, inviting you to follow along while I do so. Excuse me. Jesus uh, used these words when he taught his disciples, for the kingdom of heaven is like a, a landowner who went out early and in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. And he agreed to pay them a denarius for the day. Now, just so you know, denarius was an ancient uh, equivalent, uh, a, a sum of money, very similar to what we have by dollars and cents today. Uh, it was a common denomination of money in the day. And he agreed to pay them a, a denarius for a day's labor, and he sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So he went out again about noon, about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. And so he said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And so after the day was concluded, he had the foreman, the overseer of the workers in the field, uh, bring all the workers to him uh, in order that they might receive uh, the payment that he had promised. And so Jesus says, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landover. Those who were hired last work only one hour, they said. And you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. If I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you, don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. You know, if I counted correctly in that story, on five different occasions on the day that the story illustrates, Jesus went and found and sent workers into his harvest field, all the way from uh, probably uh, the dawn all the way to dusk, and that. Five o'clock, uh, uh, people still being sent in to uh, uh, work in the harvest field. And I'm going to be very honest with you here. I kind of sympathize, at least at initial reading, with those who were hired first. I, too, would expect better treatment. I would expect that if I had worked harder and worked longer, that uh, my labor would be worth more than those that, uh, for whatever reason, doesn't mean they were necessarily lazy, but for whatever reason, uh, labored less intensely and for a shorter amount of time. 
So I sympathize and identify with those in this particular story who have an issue with Jesus over uh, this particular story. Nevertheless, it tells us something very, very important about the grace of God. It reminds us that God's ways so often are not our ways. God's attitudes are not our attitudes. God's thinking is not our thinking. God's love is so far above our own as to be almost uh, uh, impossible to fully understand and appreciate. And certainly this story reminds us of all those things. Let me just lift out for us for a few moments uh, four facets of God's grace that I think are illustrated by Jesus' story. Grace is costly, but not to its recipients. Grace is costly, but not to his recipients. You know, the owner of the vineyard chose to give a denarius to people who had labored for a significantly less time than others who were laboring in the vineyard. He bore the expense of paying for labor that he did not fully receive. Uh, and, and he gave the same to each and every worker in the field that day. And so we understand that while grace is costly, it's not costly to you and me. The story is told one day of a, of a beggar who by the roadside, when Alexander the Great was off conquering the uh, known world of his day, uh, was calling for alms as uh, the emperor came by. And the, the man was poor and wretched and had no claim upon the ruler, no right even to ask uh, what he had asked for here. And yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. One of his uh, servants looked at him and with an astonished look on his face and said, Sir, copper coins would have adequately met the beggar's need. Why give him gold? Alexander responded in royal fashion, copper coins would suit the beggar's need, but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. Now, whatever your opinion of Alexander Great and the ruthless way in which he conquered much of the world of his day, I believe this story illustrates the point is that uh, copper coins might suit, something less might suit our need, but they would not suit Jesus' intention. And the fact that Jesus was willing to absorb the expense of the grace that is offered to you and me, and particularly as we reflect moving soon to Good Friday and Easter, how the price of that grace was executed on Calvary's cross. Grace is costly, but it was costly to the owner. It is costly to God. It is costly to Jesus, but it is offered freely to us. The second facet of God's grace that uh, I would like to uh, just draw out for a moment is that grace is based on divine generosity, not human achievement. You see, there's a part of us, even if we are, um, quote, uh, uh, doctrinally correct in our faith, that still somehow clings the idea that uh, we have to do something to earn God's love. We have to do something to earn our salvation. We have to do something for God to be generous and gracious to us. We don't deserve the denarius. We don't deserve anything from the hand of God in a fundamental way, despite his incredible love for us. Uh, but nevertheless, this is what God does. God is a generous God, and it is not based upon human uh, achievement, but it is based upon his intrinsic generosity. Some of the workers worked harder and therefore expected more. Some worked less, but were equally rewarded. You know, I find in the church that sometimes this can get in the way sometimes of those who are seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, we have experienced God's grace on our own, but uh, perhaps when it comes to us watching God extend that grace to someone that perhaps we don't feel is quite qualified to receive that grace. Maybe they've made some decisions in life that have been costly to their lifestyle. Maybe they've committed some sins that uh, we think are particularly bad. Whatever the case may be, for whatever reason, we uh, can easily become resentful and maybe even uh, push back against somebody wanting to participate in the life of the church, but whose background might not necessarily exhibit all the things that we would expect of an upstanding church member. 
And so this is where we need to understand that grace is based upon divine generosity, not on human achievement. If it were based on human achievement, none of us would be paid at the end of the day. Fourth facet of grace. According to this passage, God is not fair, but he is impartial. You know, from a human perspective at least, it was not fair what the landowner did. It was not fair that he paid the same amount to all the workers. There was nothing wrong with it. As the story makes out, uh, everybody had agreed to work for a set amount. And if you worked later in the day and got the same amount due to the generosity of the boss, well, so be it. And if you worked early and got the same amount, really nothing to complain about there. And so God was not fair in the sense that uh, he rewarded everybody in uh, distinctly different ways according to the time they spent laboring in the field, but he was impartial. He was impartial in the sense that he did the same for each and every worker. And God does the same for you and me. He, he may not seem fair to us because someone who we consider less deserving of the grace of God receives the same amount of grace as you do and I do. And in some ways, what I find is people who have maybe taken a wrong turn in life and suffered the consequences and then kind of run into the grace of God. And sometimes they have a deeper and, and broader sense of God's grace than those who, who maybe have lived all their life in an upstanding way. I'm not suggesting you go out and sin so that you can experience God's grace. That would be totally contrary to Jesus in Scripture. But my point is simply this is that uh, God is not necessarily fair by our human standards, but he is impartial, and he invites all to participate, which leads me to the final comment that I would offer regarding the grace of God in this passage. Grace is inclusive. Grace is inclusive. In other words, God so loved what? The world that he gave his only son, but it's easily missed. Later on in the scriptures, the apostle Paul wrote, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. Also in the book of Romans, he wrote these words, all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. And then also, uh, even uh, in one of the gospels, the gospel of John, we read the words, the true light that, came, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Yet he came to that which he was own, even though they did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his game, he gave the, the right to become the children of God. Even in the New Testament, as people were confronted with the amazing grace of Almighty God, particularly as it was exhibited to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. We see that it is an inclusive grace. No one should feel that uh, they are, cannot be a recipient of God's grace. Five times Jesus, uh, in the story, uh, the landowner goes and sends workers into his field. He, he never keeps going out and calling folks to be a part of those working in the vineyard. That illustrates the point that Jesus never stops calling and inviting us to become a part of his forever family. And uh, we should never think that there's anything that would disallow us from receiving what God has to offer for us. You know, it's interesting to me in that story, a couple of the times when the uh, landowner sends people to work in the field, he makes the point of saying that, uh, why are you standing here, quote, doing nothing? doing nothing. Well, no one has hired us. They hadn't received the call yet. You know, there are a lot of people around us who God wants to include in his kingdom, and you and I are the conduits. You and I are the messengers through which we offer this inclusive grace to Jesus Christ, uh, of Jesus Christ to others who so desperately need to know that there is a God who is a God of grace, who is a God of acceptance, who is a God of forgiveness, who is a God of mercy, all being different facets of this amazing grace of God. So I would hope and I would trust that in addition to what you have learned already and may learn in the future, that this story will enhance your understanding of the grace of God, that it is costly, but not to us. God bore the brunt 
God bears the cost of extending grace to us. Grace is not based, excuse me, grace is based on divine generosity, not on human achievement. It's not something that we earn through good behavior, but it is something we can receive because we serve a generous God. Grace may not seem fair from a worldly, from a human point of view, but it is impartial. It is extended to all, no matter what our past, and grace is inclusive. But sometimes it's easily missed because we labor under the assumption that God will only accept this if we clean up our act first. When God says, Jesus says, y'all come. God bless you. He loves you so very much. Chains are 